Hey everyone, I'm Ophir, and I'm going to present our ACL paper. I think this paper is super interesting, not only because I'm going to show you a very simple and efficient method that improves a bunch of language models, but also because in the process of doing so, we're going to learn a lot about how the transformer works. So let's get started. 2017, everybody knows this, um, in the Attention is All You Need paper, um, the transformer model was introduced, and if we focus on one transformer layer, we'll see that it's made up of basically two main components, the self-attention sublayer and the feed-forward sublayer. And I'm going to briefly remind you what each of these sublayers do. So in the um, self-attention sublayer, we have the inputs at the bottom and the outputs at the top. Every output is a function of the inputs. It's basically a weighted sum of the inputs, right? And that's how a self-attention sublayer looks um, in a machine translation encoder, for example. Uh, when we're doing language modeling, it's slightly different. We don't want an output in the middle to have information from the future. And so um, the nth output is a function only of the previous inputs. So that's a self-attention sublayer. The feed-forward sublayer is very simple. The nth output is a function only of the nth input. Um, yeah, that's the end of the reminder. Now, for this presentation, we're going to denote the self-attention sublayer with these um, green uh, blocks. And we're going to denote the feed-forward sublayer with these purple blocks. And so what we see here is one transformer um, layer where the um, input flows from the left to the right. And so um, for the first part of this presentation, we'll talk about language models. Um, and we're also going to focus on the Wikitext 103 data set. And our baseline is going to be the adaptive input representation transformer, which is um, a 16 layer transformer. And so we're going to um, use this string of interleaved S and Fs to um, describe that model. Now, if we look at the self-attention and feed-forward sublayers, if we look at the input and output shapes for these sublayers, we'll notice that it's all the same. And so, any ordering of these sublayers is possible. Right now, in every transformer model, we have an equal amount of self-attention sublayers and feed-forward sublayers, and we organize them in this interleaved fashion that I just showed. But since the um, input and output sizes of each one of these sublayers is identical, we're not limited to this interleaved um, ordering. Um, any ordering of these um, sublayers is possible. For example, this is a viable um, model that could run and be trained, and so is this, and so is any other sequence of S's and F's. And so um, that leads us to the main research question of this paper, which is can we find a better ordering? So um, right now we're focused on language modeling, and when I say better here, I mean performance-wise, and in language modeling, the performance metric is perplexity. So as I said before, we're doing language modeling, Wikitext 103. Our baseline is the 16-layer um, um, transformer model from the um, adaptive input representations paper. And we want to try and improve it by finding a better ordering of the um, self-attention and feed-forward sublayers. So how do we solve this? So here's a solution. Um, our model, the spaceline model, has 16 transformer layers, so it has 32 transformer sublayers. Um, to try and see if we can improve on that model, let's generate basically all possible 2 to the power of 32 models, every combination of S's and F's that's of uh, length 32. And let's train all of those models, run them on a development set, 
and whichever one does best, that's the one that we'll um, use, right? So it's a very appealing idea, but unfortunately, we need a billion GPUs um, to actually execute this idea. And since I don't have a billion GPUs, this uh, was not the solution that we used for this paper. The solution that we did use is as follows. So we're going to start with a small scale random search. As I'll show you in a bit, we're going to basically generate random models and uh, train them and run them on the validation data set. We're going to analyze the results of these random models. And um, from those conclusions that we get, we're going to manually design a new transformer ordering. Um, yeah, that's it. It's a very simple solution. A uh, random search does sound very um, inefficient or even stupid at first, but there's actually a whole bunch of papers that have shown recently that random search is actually a very good solution in um, many different fields, including neural architecture search. And so we're going to see that it also works in our case. So let's start. So we're going to run two random searches. Um, and first, I'll describe our first random search, which we're going to call shuffling. And so in this random search, we're going to take our original baseline model, which has 16 self-attention and 16 feet forward layers. And we're going to just shuffle those 32 sublayers. It's going to result in a new random model. And we'll just train 20 of those models. So here we see our first shuffled transformer. And here are 19 more of these shuffled transformers. So we've trained them all on um, the Wikitext 103 data set. We then went ahead and trained five baseline models with five different random seeds uh, to just get an accurate reading of the performance of the baseline, because there is some variance when you change the random seed. Um, and so those are the five baselines. And here are the results on the development set. And so my main uh, two observations here are that A, um, the transformer model seems to be very robust to sublayer order changes, right? Even the worst model only performs like three perplexity worse than the best baseline. And so it seems that no matter how badly you order these sublayers, you can't really ruin the performance of the uh, model too much. And the second conclusion is that, so um, the average baseline here uh, is I think 18.6 perplexity. And so in this experiment, we have four models, or yeah, five models that manage to beat the average baseline. None of them beat it by too much, but a bunch of them managed to beat it by a bit. So we've just done a small scale random search, and we've already um, um, managed to slightly beat the baseline transformer. Now we'll move on to our second random search. Um, so our first random search had this constraint that we always used 16 self-attention and 16 feed forward sublayers. Um, but maybe if we relax that constraint, we'll be able to find an even better transformer. So for this random search, we're going to uh, look at our baseline. Our baseline has 250 million parameters, about 250 million parameters. And now we're just going to random, randomly generate sequences of S's and F's until we reach that 250 million um, parameter budget limit. And then we're going to run those models. And just a small reminder, a feed forward sublayer has twice the parameters of a self-attention sublayer. And so as you'll see in a bit, um, in models where um, the random generator generated lots of F's, um, the model was shorter. And in models where lots of S's were generated, the model was um, longer or deeper. And so here are two of these randomly generated models. And here are 18 more. 
And again, we have those five uh, different baseline models trained with uh, different random seeds. And here are the perplexities on the development set. And so again, we see that um, even the worst model doesn't perform too badly. We have a bunch of models beating the average baseline's performance. Um, but if we compare the results of the second um, random search, what we notice is that um, not only is the average model's performance um, worse, but uh, the variance is also higher. And so um, our conclusion, our first conclusion here, is that it seems like if you want to do well on average, um, you should stick to having um, an equal number of self-attention and feed-forward sublayers. But there is another thing that we can learn from these experiments. Um, and in order to do this analysis, I'm going to um, first show you um, uh, what it means to split a model into two um, halves that contain an equal amount of parameters. So if we have this two-layer transformer model and we would like to split it into two um, halves with an equal amount of parameters, obviously the bottom half and the top half are the same. They're each just one transformer layer. But if we have this model, um, in order to split it into two equally, um, into two halves that have an equal amount of parameters, um, we have to split it like so. Um, and the reason I showed you this uh, splitting method is because we're now going to use it to analyze all of these randomly generated models. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take the 40 random uh, randomly generated models that we uh, just trained. And we're going to split all of them into two halves, a bottom half and a top half, such that both halves contain an equal amount of parameters. And we're going to look at the average self-attention and feed-forward sublayer counts in the bottom halves and in the top halves. So we're first going to look at the average sublayer count in the bottom half of the model in models that perform worse than the baseline. And this is it. And there's nothing interesting here. Now we're going to look at the average sublayer count in the bottom half of the model for models that perform better than the baseline. And what we learn is that in models that perform better than the baseline, there are more self-attention layers in the bottom half. Now let's do the same thing for the top halves. And so again, we have the models that perform worse than the baseline. We're looking at the average sublayer count in their top half. Nothing too interesting. And now we're going to look at the models that perform better than the baseline. And we see that in their top half, they have more feed forward sublayers and less self attention sublayers. And so our conclusions are as follows. As I previously said, um, it seems like if we'd like to get good results, our models should be balanced. So the number of self-attention sublayers should be equal to the number of feed-forward sublayers. Second conclusion that we just saw is that it seems like if we want to um, generate uh, good models, we should have more self-attention sublayers at the bottom and more feed-forward sublayers at the top. So this leads us to the obvious conclusion that this should be the best transformer model in the world. We have 16 self-attention sublayers at the bottom and 16 um, feed-forward sublayers at the top. And so I trained this model on the Wikitext 103 data set, and it didn't actually perform well. It was basically just as good as the baseline, even though it adheres to these two properties that we just mentioned. Um, and so we know that these two models perform just as well. This is a baseline. This is this crazy model that we just ran. And um, we tried thinking of other models that would fit these uh, two constraints that I just showed before. 
and we came up with the sandwich transformer, which is this. So we have a bunch of self-attention sublayers followed by the regular interleaved um, transformer pattern, and then at the top we have a bunch of feedforward sublayers, and the number of self-attention uh, sublayers at the bottom is equal to the number of feedforward sublayers at the top. So we call this a sandwich transformer, and the number of self-attention layers at the bottom minus one is what we call the sandwiching coefficient. And so if you have um, a transformer model with 16 self-attention and 16 feedforward sublayers, there are 16 possible um, sandwiching coefficients. Um, when your sandwiching coefficient is zero, it's just the regular interleaved baseline. And then when it's one, it looks like this. And when it's two, it looks like this. And when it's 15, it looks like that. So we took these 16 different models and we trained them on Wikidex 103. And what we see here is that as you increase the sandwiching coefficient, um, performance improves, peaking at a sandwiching coefficient of six, and then it starts degrading. Um, this point here, I think, was just a bad random seed, and the true performance is probably somewhere around here. Um, the red line, this red line, is the average baseline performance, and this uh, red line is the best baseline's performance. And so what we see here is that uh, a bunch of these um, sandwich transformers manage to beat even the best baseline, uh, which is cool because for the baseline we ran uh, five different models with five different random seeds, but for our sandwich transformers we did not modify the random seed at all. Um, anyways, the best model here is the one with a, a sandwich coefficient of six, and so we took that model and we then trained it with five different random seeds. And what we see here is that not only does it beat the average, uh, the baseline's performance always, its variance is also less than half of the variance of the baseline. And so uh, not only do we manage to beat the performance, we're also massively reducing the variance with regards to um, random seed. So now I'll show a, a bunch of results on some other language modeling um, data sets. Oh, and also on the test set of Wikitex 103. Until now we've been dealing with the validation set. Now we're gonna run our model on the test set for the first time. Um, so what I'd like to point out is that all the models that we're going to present are simply reorderings of the baseline. We do not modify any hyperparameters. Um, we're not going to do any kind of random seed exploration on the test set. We're not modifying the sublayer code in any way. We're not modifying the learning rate or the dropout or anything. We're simply reordering these models. And so these are our results on the Wikitext 103 test set. Um, a a cool result here is that not only do we manage to improve on our strong baseline, but we also manage to beat Transformer XL, even though we have 4% uh, less parameters, and we also run match faster. Um, we do not beat the results of the KNNLM. That model um, is a massive model that uh, queries the entire training set during inference, and so runs um, slower than our model. We also ran our model on a Toronto Book Corpus language modeling data set, and there we did manage to beat the KNNLM. Um, and here the best um, sandwiching coefficient was seven and not six. So what we do is we just sample a bunch of sandwiching coefficients, we train those models on the validation set, and whichever one is best on the validation set is what we uh, uh, run on the test set. So up until now, we've only talked about word level language modeling. Um, now we're going to talk about character level language modeling. So we first ran um, our model on the text eight data set. Since the model that we've been using until now, the adaptive input representation model uh, did not show any results on character level language modeling, we are now going to use a different baseline. We're going to use the adaptive span model. So we ran that model five times. Um, we trained that model five different times, 
and this was the result on the test set. We then found the um, best sandwich coefficient for our model, which was three in this case, and then we ran that on the test set just once, and we did not manage to um, significantly outperform the baseline. Um, that story is different for NWIC 8, uh, where we do manage to um, outperform the baseline by a significant amount. This time, our optimal sandwich coefficient was five. And not only do we outperform the baseline, we also match um, the current state of the art, which is um, the compressive transformer. And what's cool about this result is that we match a state of the art using a model that has 25% less parameters than the state of the art. And our model, uh, again, runs much faster than the compressive transformer. As I previously said, uh, the implementation of uh, the sandwiching method is incredibly easy. You go into your favorite NLP framework. You go into the definition of um, a transformer layer. You'll see that the first, this is FairSeq. Um, and so in the definition of a transformer layer, you'll see that the first half is uh, running the self-attention sublayer. The second half of the code runs the um, feed-forward sublayer. And so you just extract these into two different functions. And then instead of calling um, this function, the transformer layer function, 16 times, you just call the, either the self-attention or the feed-forward um, function um, in a way that matches the uh, sandwich ordering that you'd like to uh, run. So up until now, we've talked about character and word level language modeling, but now we're also going to talk about translation. So we've shown that sandwiching improves a wide range of language models, and now we'd like to understand if sandwiching also improves translation models. So we're not going to run a random search again. We're not going to try and find an optimal ordering for a translation. We just want to understand if sandwiching helps tr in translation models. And in translation models, we have an encoder and a decoder. The encoder is usually like a six layer transformer model. And uh, these models are basically um, very similar to the language models that we've uh, um, used until now. Um, they're similar because they basically contain self-attention and feed-forward sublayers organized in this interleaved fashion. So if we'd like to sandwich these um, encoders, that's very straightforward. But decoders have a third kind of sublayer, which is um, shown here. This is the context um, or source attention layer. This is where the decoder attends to the encoder um, output. And so um, we're going to denote decoders as such, where we have this um, gray C, which represents the context attention sublayer. And so now um, sandwiching is kind of less straightforward. What do we do with the C sublayer? So what we decided to do was basically to stick the S and C sublayers together and look at them as one unit. And so if we have a three-layer um, decoder like here, um, we're going to sandwich it in the following way. If we sandwich it with a sandwiching coefficient of, of one, it's going to look like this. Right, so we took two, we took this S and C and moved it down, and this F and moved it up. And if we sandwich it again, it's going to look like this. Right, so that's what decoder sandwiching is. So now we're going to um, run um, our machine translation models on the English German WMT data set. So we're going to train the baseline again five times. We're going to get about 29 blue points. And now we're going to do sandwiching either only in the encoder or only in the decoder. So we'll sandwich the encoder and keep the decoder just you know the normal uh, interleaved pattern. And then we'll sandwich the decoder and keep the 
encoder constant. And we're going to do that for all possible sandwiching coefficients. So our <coughs> baseline model has six layers in the encoder and decoder. And so our sandwiching coefficients are between 0 and 5. And so we're first going to do this for the encoder. right? So we're sandwiching the encoder, and we're not doing anything to the decoder. And the results are nothing. Absolutely nothing happens for the first three um, sandwiching coefficients. And then performance slightly degrades. And the decoder, when we, dec when we sandwich just the decoder, um, the result is pretty much the same. And so sandwiching does not help in neural machine translation models. Um, this result didn't surprise me because in my experiments in language modeling, I noticed that um, sandwiching always improved or almost always improved models that had 16 layers or more. But when I um, sandwiched smaller models with 10 or 8 or 12 layers, um, performance never really seemed to improve. And so sandwiching uh, seems to be a method that only works when you have 16 layers or more. And that's great, or maybe 14 layers or more. But you need to have definitely more than six layers. And so that's great when you're doing language modeling, where all the state of the art models have 16 uh, uh, layers in word level language modeling or 24 layers in character level language modeling. But in NMT, where a lot of our models have only six layers, sandwiching um, does not seem to help. So let's go back to our results in language modeling. Um, we're going to end this presentation by trying to understand uh, why does sandwich modeling improve results? Now, this question is way too complicated, and we, didn't really, we don't really have an answer for that yet. And so here, we're going to try and answer a slightly simpler question, which is, do sandwich models behave differently than um, their uh, you know, interleaved uh, baseline cattern parts? Um, and behavior of neural models is also very complicated um, to understand. And so we're going to answer an even simpler question. And the question that we'll answer is, do sandwich models attend differently? Given a sandwich model and uh, interleaved baseline on a certain data set, do, they, do their attention uh, patterns differ? So in order to um, answer that, we're going to need to build a function that can take in two models, trained on the same data set, and compare their um, attention patterns on some test set. And so um, here's how uh, we built that function. So if we have just one attention head, we can choose a specific time step in this test set that we're looking at. So for example, here I chose the fourth time step. Right, We just read four words, and we're trying to predict um, the next word here. So we can choose a specific time step. And we're going to choose a specific layer. So here I chose the first layer in this model, um, where we just got the word embeddings. And now we're trying to compute the output here in the first layer. So if we've chosen a specific time step and a specific layer, we now have attention values that um, our model computes for um, the input words, right? So this is model number one. And we have attention values also for model number two for the same time step in the test set and the same um, layer. And if we have these two attention distributions, we can use a metric such as the earth movers distance. And we plug these numbers in, and we get um, back uh, a number 0 0.05 in this case that specifies <clears throat> how different these attention distributions are. So that's great, but unfortunately, um, all state-of-the-art transformer models have more than one head, right? So when we have eight heads in model one and eight heads in model two, how do we compare these attention distributions? We could simply compare attention head number one in the first model to attention head number two. Sorry.
we could compare attention head number one in the first model to attention head number one in the second model and attention head number two in the first model to attention head number two in the second model. But that would be stupid because there's nothing that would make it such that the first attention head in the first model would correspond to the first attention head in the second model, right? These heads are randomly initialized. Uh, there would be no reason to believe that uh, the attention heads would correspond in such a simple way. And so to find the optimal pairing of the attention heads between the two models, we use um, the Hungarian algorithm, which gives us the pairings uh, between model one and model two's heads, such that the sums of the distances between each pair is minimized. And so that's it, that's our metric. We're going to look at every time step in this test set. We're going to look at every layer. We'll run the Hungarian algorithm. We'll find the optimal matching of heads. We'll compute the distances between these pairs of heads. We'll sum that up, and then we'll average that across all time steps, across all layers. And here's what we see when we do that. Um, when we compare, so we're going to train all these models on the Wikitex 103 um, um, data set, and we're going to uh, compare their attention patterns on the Wikitex 103 validation data set. So we're going to train two baseline models uh, with two different random seeds, two sandwich models with two different random seeds. This is uh, sandwich six, the optimal sandwich on Wikitex 103. And then we're going to compare a baseline model to a sandwich model. And so when we compare a baseline model to a baseline model or a sandwich model to a sandwich model, these are the average atten attention distances that we get. And now we're going to compare a baseline model to a sandwich model, and we're going to see very different, um, the, distant, the average attention distance here is very different. And um, again, we ran this with five different pairs of baseline and sandwich models so that we could get a confidence interval. And so the conclusion here is that it seems like the uh, tension distributions in the baseline and the sandwich models are different. So we took a model, we simply reordered it, and it not only gets uh, better performance, but it seems to be getting that better performance by attending um, in a different manner. Now, you could say that um, this difference in attention is only due to um, the fact that the sandwich models perform better, but that's probably not the case. Um, to show this, what I did was I took two baseline models, um, and because um, the uh, baseline's uh, variance is so high, I could take uh, a, a really bad baseline and a really good baseline, where the difference, the difference in their um, perplexities was about one perplexity. And I computed the average attention distance between those two baselines, and the average attention distance was <clears throat> just like between any two baselines. And so it seems like this difference in attention patterns is not only due to um, the sandwich models being um, having better uh, performance. So that's it. Um, that's our paper. I'm going to highlight a few of the conclusions. Um, so number one, it seems like transformers are very, very robust to uh, sublayer order changes. Yes, if you want to achieve state-of-the-art results, <clears throat> you do have to use a very specific ordering, and you can't just use whatever you want. But the big picture here is that no matter how you order the um, transformer sublayers, it seems like you can't really screw up the performance too much. Um, I think the um, neural architecture search alternative that we used here is pretty cool. Instead of run, running a huge neural architecture search that requires thousands of GPUs, you can run a very small scale random search. <clears throat> we only trained 40 models. You can analyze the results of that random search and then use that analysis to manually design a better model. And lastly, um, as I've said a few times, the only thing we did here was change the ordering of the sublayer. We did not change 
the sublayer formulations at all. We didn't add any parameters. We didn't change any nonlinearities. We didn't change the way it's initialized. We only reordered um, these models, and we still found um, a pretty good performance increase. <clears throat> and so the lesson here is that improvements can still be found without very big architecture changes. Thank you so much for watching my presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to email me.